Welcome to Living Martial Arts with Master Ray Gale, aka The Dark Master. Living Martial Arts discuss and examines the everyday exercise, philosophy, and lifestyle of the martial arts enthusiast. The host talks about his own training, past and present, and he also interviews many martial artists to discover how they continue to live their own martial arts journey. Tune in for top tips on how to get the best out of your martial art. Or perhaps you're thinking of starting a martial art. This podcast offers you an easy way to dip your toe in. Sign up for the newsletter at livingmartialarts.com and get regular updates and training tips direct to your inbox. Follow the Dark Master on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram at Living Martial Arts. Okay, hello everyone. It's the uh, it's me, the Dark Master, uh, back with another podcast, another fantastic uh, guest uh, who's very very experienced in the uh, in the martial arts, and it'd be really really good. Uh, to uh, to catch up with him because it's been many years since um, we've uh, <laughs> interacted with each other. Let's put it that way. So I've got Mister Mister Tony Stokes uh, on the line, and um, you know I'm looking forward to this chat. So how are you doing, Tony? Hi, Raymond. How are you, sir? I'm fantastic. It's... I'm fantastic. Wow, it's been. I think the last time we spoke, it was when Star Wars was playing in the cinema or something. <laughs> That's how long ago. It feels <laughs> well. Well, I probably remember that because I tell you, what, I hate Star Wars. I've never watched any Star Wars in my life. <laughs> right, this past cut. This podcast is over. I can't speak to you. You're, you're, I can't. Sci- sci-fi should be banned. Just, just like um, uh, <laughs> the current government or governments, politicians should be banned. Star Wars. I'm sorry, I don't do sci-fi. I cannot do it. How dare you? I'm deleting you from Facebook. Yeah, that's, but, my, that's... but 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 mind you, you're you're talking to a guy that doesn't have a television. Um, so you know, <laughs> what can I say? God, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to burn my my uh, Obi Wan <laughs> Kenobi shirt directly after this podcast. Yeah, no, 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 no TV for me. Um, I can't even remember what I saw last at cinema. To be honest, but there we go. Hey, listen, it's lovely to lovely to see you. Lovely to catch up with you again. Um, and um, you know, nice to know that uh, you're well and you're uh, you're doing well. So. You know, without further ado, I'm going to bang on with this. And now, as I, as I always mentioned on this, this first part can take three days, particularly sure. for people that have been in the martial arts a long time. But mm-hmm. I just wanted you to give a, a sort of an overview um, of your martial arts journey, you know, from uh, the start of it and, you know, where, where you've been, where you're going now, and perhaps we can move on from there. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Raymond. Um, I appreciate it. Um, basically, I mean, I started when I was about seven. Um, my mum actually was a black belt in judo, and she used to go to a school in Morland Road mm. in Bath, and so I went to, to the same one as her. Um, and I did that for a few years, and then I quickly sort of moved towards karate, like most people do. Um and that was taught by a very, I always remember this incredibly strong woman that was also in Oldfield Park. And um, I did that for for a number of years. And then as I got older, I sort of just got into different things. I did gymnastics at Baskervilles. And also I started boxing there, um, which was a good sort of transition thinking back. Now, at the time, of course, that was just me being very visceral, not really knowing what I was doing, but it, it, it paid dividends. And then I started to get into other things, did a bit of Aikido, a bit of Kendo. Um, and then as I got, uh, it became a teenager, I found out about Taekwondo. And then obviously I came along to to you guys, Raymond Gale and Mark Osborne, the uh, yes. <laughs> gangsters of the Southwest. Um, yeah, the tall and short black and white of it. <laughs> yeah, who were, who were running things, as they say, on the streets. Um and um, yes, yeah, so I was with the TAGB, did that for a number of years. Um, and then I sort of um, found out about more about Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do. You know, we all know about Bruce Lee, but I think as a kid, you never really realised what he did, you know, yeah, like yeah. growing up, um, yeah. 70s and 80s and that. You never really knew what he was about. It wasn't until 
later on that people started to really get into who he actually was as a man and what his art was. Mm -hmm. So I started getting into Jeet Kune Do and I was going up to London to do that. And um, then obviously I was, that opened up the sort of hornet's nest. And um, then I, I got over to Whitchurch and started training in Muay Thai with um, a guy called Fira. He was taught by a guy called Master Crin in Whitchurch in Bristol. Yeah. And um, that was one of the first schools that I am aware of, apart from people like Toddy, Woody, Sken, that were teaching, certainly in the Southwest, real Muay Thai, you know? Yeah. yeah Elbows, yeah. knees, low shin kicks, uh, full contact sparring. Um, they, you know, they even did a bit of Muay Baran, which is the headbutts and the, the yeah, old... Yeah the old style of Muay Thai. So, uh, you know, Krabby Krabong. So then um, I continued with Muay Thai because it was just really effective and it suited yeah. my, my the way I used to think and feel. Yeah. And um, then I continued um, to, I had, I had three schools in Bath, which were, I guess for the Southwest, they were quite ahead of their time thinking in retrospect because they were one of the first ones that I was aware of, apart from a few Jeet Kune Do schools up north and in the Midlands that were introducing MMA, introducing grappling, introducing trapping from Wing Chun and Kali and Iskrima. Um, they, you know, the stick work, the knife taken yeah. to the ground, the, encompassing the full ranges of fighting. Yeah, um, sure. And then... Um, I left to travel. So I went to teach in America. Um, I was teaching as a counselor over there um, at a camp, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I basically traveled around America for about a year teaching. Um, then I flew to Mexico. I was there for about five years living there with a, I had a Mexican girlfriend. So I was teaching there and I was, I, I, became, I became an English teacher, an English uh, language uh, foreign teacher teaching you know english as a second language to um non-native speakers and i supplement my income by teaching martial arts you know and it worked really well because even though remember this is pre-internet yes. it was one of the first time that was all evolving and i was discovering that hang on a minute you can have your cake and eat it too you can travel and teach and train and keep traveling so i kept doing it so then i came back to the uk a few times sorry unless, unless you have children <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i which i did then but god <laughs> yeah I, I i i don't I, I still don't i'm um so you know um then i uh i traveled around europe a bit then i i came i sort of wanted to to really go to asia properly so i went to to thailand and this this is early 2002 um, I basically just, at that time, I'd saved quite a bit of money so I could travel freely and not work. Um, but I, I was doing the odd lesson and the odd language course, but I was predominantly doing research, training, teaching. Um, and I, then I opened up a, like a small media, sort of independent freelance media company where I started filming what I was doing and documenting it and interviewing people. Um, and I just worked my way around Southeast Asia, you know, Cambodia, Laos, Hong Kong, you know, all the way up to China, Burma, um, yeah. but almost every province in Thailand. Right. Um, you know, I went everywhere and studied, trained, studied, trained. Um, and I was in Thailand for 12 years doing that. I made that my base. Sure. Sure. Just, just, just a couple of things. That, um, sorry to, to sort of cut, cut your, your your flow there. It's interesting sorry. what you, what you say about Muay Thai because um, yeah, I mean myself and um, uh, Mark Astro, we we experienced a bit of Muay Thai in the eighties. Actually, we used to go. Up, we used to be invited up regularly by Mass Sken um, up, up yeah. to old, up to Oldham and Manchester around that area because um, it was quite big up there. And obviously, we knew people like uh, Sandy Holt, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and um, he he actually used to get us to do demonstrations for him. He said, he said oh, you know, can you do a demonstration prior to this Thai fight and so things like that. Yeah. And um, it, it was it was it was quite good actually going up and seeing that and seeing you know the at the time we were sort of looking at the comparisons between uh, taekwondo and Thai Thai boxing and that type of thing. 
Um, and, and it was good. It was a good experience for us, actually. Uh, you know, we had a look, look into different camps of martial arts and, and looking into the sort of Thai camp was, was very, very interesting. It was really, yeah. really good. So it was, uh, you know, something that, um, yeah, that we, we, we always... We also enjoyed going up. We also enjoyed that sort of, uh, you know, chatting to the Thai fighters and talking mm. to them about, you know, different techniques and so on. Uh, so it was good. It was good. Did so you was- did you ever do much? Did you did you, did you or Mark ever get into the, any of the Kali or the Eskrima or the trapping? Well, stra- strange enough, um, I, I don't know if you remember um, uh, Master Black, um, John Black. Well, I can't remember how. Uh, whether he was he, you were around at that time, but but basically, uh, Master Black was uh, from Exeter and he was in the army. Okay, um, and um, he did some um, some short stick work um, in China. Oh, okay, because he he started in um, some of the Chinese martial arts, went on to Taekwondo. Uh, and in actual fact, he used to do some stick fighting uh, with us, some short stick with us, uh, which was which was quite good. My my thing. For me, as a, as um, doing martial arts, is I just love the empty hand stuff. I didn't really like weapons as such. Um, yeah. It just I don't know. My psyche for me was, yeah. You know, I just wanted to use what I had, and um, you know, my sort of martial arts part of my martial arts, a huge part, which is still today, was actually the physical conditioning of it. Yeah, and that's what I loved with the martial arts. It wasn't actually so much the fighting, although you know, in competitions, I, I, I you know had a certain amount of success. But actually, even today, what really excites me is with the physical conditioning that martial arts can give you. So, yeah. yeah, you were you were always in good shape. I do remember. Well, uh, hope, hopefully, still am. I'm, I'm on. I'm, I've got uh, my number has a six in it now, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm still training. I was I was training before uh, this podcast, so a bit, a bit wow. Heavy at most days uh, and i still love it still love it yeah I, I i think i think with martial arts it depends what what sort of person you are yes you know like i i'm you know i'm doing a master's at the moment i'm i got into academics quite later on did sure. my degree in my early 30s doing a master's now and yeah i really enjoy academia because it teaches you how to think yes and i think that's important a lot of people they they do one thing but it's your your mind is the thing that you, you you're left with. So I think that's the important. Even when the body goes right, the you know the mind yes. is 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 the hard drive. And it's like, um, for me, it was it was always more than just fighting. You know, when I was younger, I was quite combative, and obviously as you get older, you become yeah. less combative, and your 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 mind changes. I agree. But uh, but um. I think that really just just is the framework or sure. the pathway of how people train and why they train and the way they train. Yeah, and um, I think there is a certain amount of DNA in there. Like strikers, a good striker is, I think, born a good striker, and then they can tweak it. You right. know, and I think it's very hard to teach striking mm. personally from a from a method point of view. It's very difficult. It can be tall, but I think it's nature and then nurture. And then if you look at like, um, you know, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's a great equaliser because almost anyone can do it to quite a high level. But then if you put them in a Muay Thai match, it changes the ball game if you can't go to the ground. So it's like, you know, all of that stuff, I think, is about, the way the person thinks it's like yeah. it's like art isn't it or books you know certain people will gravitate towards yeah. a certain lineage of knowledge no I, I i agree and i think you know uh, i mean I, I did karate before i did taekwondo before i um you know, trained in taekwondo uh, and i enjoyed the karate and you know when i first went along i thought oh yeah this is this is quite good but, uh, yeah. but i remember going to taekwondo for the first time thinking wow this is me this is this is what I want to do, <laughs> and, and um, yeah. yeah, you know, and certain things over the years, um, you know, I, I, for example, I remember um, I did a bit of trapeze actually, I did a bit of trapeze in the circus school in Bristol, and oh. I really loved that. I thought, wow, you know, if, if I hadn't done martial arts, then wow, I would have loved to have uh, 
you know, gone into trapeze in a big way, for example, because I just got that high from it, just got that buzz that, wow, this this is me. And it's a similar sort of buzz that I got when I started uh, my Taekwondo. Yeah. And um, some similar I mean, skill sets in there as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. Dextral. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I, I, I agree with what you say about the um, coming back to what you said before about the mind is, is very important. And particularly as you get older, I mean, you know, I, I, I meditate yeah. now. Um, well, I couldn't have done that. I don't think in my in my twenties. Um, yeah. So I quite like the meditation. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, studying to be a breathing instructor actually, uh, as well. In the, oh, Wim Wim Hof. No, no, I do Wim Hof, but it's in the Buteco method uh, okay. of, of breathing. So I'm I'm studying that. Um, but things things that I like to keep my mind strong with guitar playing and playing new pieces and harmonica playing. And for me, that's all all mind work, you know, just that um, uh, introducing new things and, and not just yeah, that's good. Know, going on with the norm. But, uh, sorry, I, I lost your flow there. Go on, go for it. No, that's good. You know, it's it's all it's all knowledge. Yeah, yeah, certainly. It's all, it's all learning. You know, that's what that's what this man's always talking about. You know, old, yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's all it's all part of the same thing. You know. It's, like uh i think it was certainly when i was young like watching people like bruce lee they sort of they were almost like father figures and they were role models for a lot of young kids in the 80s and 90s that maybe didn't have that and they yeah. were the fact that he was asian but he didn't seem asian no right no. you know and more american really <laughs> yeah he was he was western but he was like his system encapsulated his mindset of just i'm just a human being you know sure and it's like when pearl um and asks him in the in the interview about you know do you consider yourself asian or american and he says as, as confucius says i consider myself just a, a human being you know that's that's a good role model to have and like to, to, to see that at a young age yeah but not really understand what it means um sure. and then and then when you're older you're still thinking about that and then you realize the depth of what he was doing but you know he had a, a degree in philosophy you know, from university in Washington, you know, he's an artist, he was a photographer, he was a scholar, he was a writer. Mm. So there's not many people that are like polymaths, you know, that can yeah. transcend what he is. And he was using martial arts really as just a vessel yeah, to just, yeah, I, promote, I agree. promote his mindset and his method. And um, I think he's misunderstood by a lot of martial artists because they – they have a linear logic with him but as soon as you open up what he was really about which is why you i i delved into different arts to yeah. figure out not so much just about jeet Kune Do, but applying that mindset to you know that method of thinking to other things and it and it works you know yeah 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 no, it, it is an interesting one i mean i think you know for, for me my um sort of association with, with Bruce Lee was uh, in the seventies, yeah. you know, uh, going through that, and obviously, you, you know that 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 um, that name, that Bruce Lee name, um, you know, we, we used to sneak into the uh, the cinema, um, you know, underage to watch the Bruce Lee films. Because they were they were yeah. exes then, weren't they? They were the yeah. Ox, yeah. They were the Jackers, the bloke who ran the British Broadcasting Corporation, some sort of uh, toff. Uh, yeah. it had a real stick up his ass about the jackers for some weird yeah. reason so he banned them didn't he, he cut them yeah all. And then, that's right and the yeah. uncut versions came out which i managed to get hold of because i used to like pirating videos and uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it, it, it was it was always seemed quite naughty i remember myself and uh mark sneaking out you know late at night to go and watch uh bruce lee movies down the europa cinema and um you know saying oh, oh sorry how old are you oh you know we're we're 18 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. never, never asked for age we just used to go in but uh yeah, you've got a, you've got a moustache on this id <laughs> yeah exactly I, I i actually tell people and it, this is very true that uh i, I had my first shave uh, when i was thir- when i was 30 on my birthday i decided right i need to have a shave okay. so on my 30th birthday i shaved but up until that point it was very difficult so to get into some of these things i used to use my mum's eyebrow pencil <laughs> on my on my top lip uh, yeah. Just to just to darken it slightly, <laughs> so I look a bit older than I was. Stimulate stimulate the growth. <laughs> yeah, so. that, that's an interesting method there, Raymond. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hey, uh, well, one thing coming back to you know your martial arts journey, particularly um, 
you mentioned about America. Yeah. And myself and um, uh, Mark, you know, when we left, we left the, the TAGB uh, in 2000. And, um, you know, we formed uh, Puma because we, we sort of right. wanted to go, go back to a, a bit more of a traditional base, really. Um, you know, we had General Che, General Che, the founder of Taekwondo, was still alive then. He came over and he really opened our association at that time. It was a quite a big, uh, big event. Um, but I remember going to America and talking to a lot of American martial artists. And I, and I didn't like it. I didn't. For, for me, um, as soon as we started talking, they said, well, you know, how many students got? How, many, how much money do you make? And I'm thinking, well, is that, is that relevant? Is that important? So how, how did you deal with that side of it over there? Um, I wasn't there that long. I was te- I was teaching at a camp, so I was I yeah. was uh, that was I was teaching kids. Um, oh, right, that was okay. that, that that was a job. But um, when I travelled around America, yeah, it was just starting to become, I guess, industrialised is a word I would use. Yeah, and franchised. The Americans, we got them to thank for that. And um, you know, they do they do sort of put everything into a box, and it's that what I would call the sort of McDonald's mentality of right yeah. you know quick fast yeah but ultimately it's unsatisfying you know it's it's how to package something they're incredibly good at branding yes um i think that sort of changed a bit now because things like brazilian jiu-jitsu and mma and boxing and muay thai have been recognized as legitimate systems which are effective and can do both quite well Sure. Um, so I think that's kind of bridged that gap. There are sort of a lot of people now teaching Muay Thai, which I wouldn't really consider fighters or Muay Thai people. They're doing the certificate, and they they've but they haven't fought or they haven't trained with Thais or been to Thailand. Yeah. That sort of cookie cutter stuff is fine, but yeah. I wouldn't call that Muay Thai. They in Thailand, for example, I was training in Lumpini, the yeah. original the original Lumpini. And I used to train above the stadium there. Um, most of the Thais were just gnarly. They were all from Isan and they were, you know, I, I speak Thai so I could talk to them. Not a word of English, you know, there's old school, full contact. Um, they would use elbows, sparring, knees. Um, it was just seen as normal. They would have a very kind of jokey, jovial. The Thais are very like that when they train very informal i like that style because i think it's it's it it promotes creativity and it promotes the individual to be to be better than themselves as opposed to a group thing you know sure. but um the, the the i mean all those guys probably had about 300 fights plus each and you you could tell that when they did something they they always did it like they were trying to hurt someone you know and um it just appealed to me that that it was the honesty of it that i liked with thais thai people and that's why i stayed there for 12 years because it just is an an honesty a genuineness about them which i noticed that probably wasn't as prolific in america where it was more about the image it was more about the the badge the certificate but yet none of them could really spar and and also and also the my impression was the times I went there because we went to some conventions was about the dollar um, and and how much they could make out of it, which is okay. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that as long as people are giving a, a reasonable service. Um, sure. But but I felt that was ultimately a, for a lot of them that was their bottom line. You know they they um, and, and unless, getting in and out. Yeah, unless they were making you know a, a good sort of whack that they weren't really happy. But um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I th- I th- sorry, I think that can be done. But yes. I think it's got to be done in the right way. And I think that unless you've got, like, I, there's certain schools in Thailand now that are like Tiger Muay Thai in Phuket in a, a place called Soi Talet, which is like a lot of the UFC fighters train there. And yeah. I used to I used to go there. And um, uh, Top Team is another one. And um, some of the best fighters go to, if you look up Tiger Muay Thai. And um, that is... It's on a big scale, but it's done as an individual thing. So you you would never train as a group. You're, you're everyone has one instructor each, right? So they so they keep the quality high because they're training 
real fighters to fight. You do have commercial people that come in that, you know, pay money, tourists that will go on fitness holidays, you know, and mm-hmm. I want to do Muay Thai, I want to do Kali, I want to do a bit of Kung yeah. Fu, I want to do some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's fine, but they will be um, treated sl- in a diff- slightly different way because, yeah. you know, they're not fighters. But yeah. um, I think it can work. It's just getting the transition right. Yeah, yeah. And making sure that the people that are teaching the people, uh, you know, uh, know what they're doing. Yeah, and, sure. and that they haven't done a sort of weekend course and there's another certificate or i've done this course there's another certificate and then they're they look like that but they're if they were to spar with some of these people in lumpini they just they yeah they pro- you know they probably wouldn't get past the first round so i think as long as the quality is there it can be done and i think that's where people like jiu- brazilian jiu-jitsu have done it very well with their system they're very strict about how they grade people yeah, and um, yeah. I think that works. I think Muay Thai do the same. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, no, good. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not uh, painting the whole of the USA with the same brush. For example, you know, I went yeah. to um, early '80s. I went to Los Angeles uh, and visited Grandmaster Heel Cho, Taekwondo Master, you yeah. know, his his dojang. Um, you know, and, and he was um, he was very very good. I mean, he had a uh, you know quite a good student student base but he was he was quite strict with his teaching and um you know uh I, I quite liked his philosophy of martial arts which was really um something that i'd never heard before the way way he talked about martial arts and martial artists and the way you should be and uh, what type of person you should be and that type of thing uh, and that that was great that was that was really really good but, uh, yeah. just um uh, move, moving on from there, um, you know, we talked a little bit about your your martial arts journey. So, uh, so how how are you living your martial arts day to day now at the moment? Um, at the moment, I'm sort of focusing mostly on my my masters, okay, because um, I'm back in the UK. Yeah, sure. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm not. I don't have a commercial class. Yes. Um, and I teach. Um, if I teach, I would mostly do it privately. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, the 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 way it's structured here is a bit different. Mm. Um, I I sort of prefer the Asian style of training and teaching. To be honest, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you're outside. It's hot. It's warm. It's you know. It's it's <laughs> hard. It's, it makes you want to try. Oh, horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. I dare, no, I, I dare well, I enjoy it so much. Well, do, do you know what? I, I I tell people this that I, I see. I don't mind the I don't mind the cold. Uh, and I remember yeah. go, going to Jamaica to see my parents and trying to work out and thinking it's just too hot. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. <laughs> trying to work out there, um, I was quite happy when I came back. Thought, yeah, good old cold England. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one thing that I noticed about the Thais is their work rate was just uh, unreal. Mm. You know, the the foreigners uh, they call us phalangs. We would um, struggle because of the heat and uh, just the work. And I think it's because of the heat. It's a bit like Sherpas, you know, when they train at altitude. It's yeah. that kind of thing. Their lungs. You get sure. used to this. Heat. It's relentless. It's thirty five degrees every day, but yeah. you do get used to it. You manage it. Sure. And um, I would watch the way they were training. Just, you know, it's normal for them to do 30 rounds, just one after the other, you know, yeah. just continuously. And then then you start, that's the warm-up, and then you yeah. start sparring. Um, over here, that kind of training isn't practical in the real world because of the yeah. way Western society is structured. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and they're camps, so they're open from, like, 10 o'clock in the morning, some till 10 o'clock at night, and, they're you know, you would live there and yeah. um, train. But it's that thing of... Yeah, the, the the geography, the environment does change the body. I think like the because when you're breathing, you have to breathe in a certain way because it's so humid. Mm. And uh just yeah, the, the work rate of the tides is I would always notice that a lot of the Westerners after the first round of a just red, puffy mess, mm-hmm. and the tie would be like not even sweating. And it's 35. Anyone who's trained in Thailand knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 a different it's hard to describe it's a different world and um 
yeah, it's very it's something very organic about it, very primal about the way yeah. they train that really brings out the the best in people, you know. Yeah, sure, sure. No, that, that's good. No, it, it, it's um t- to be honest, I I, I think that f- for for me, you know, if if as a martial artist, if you can train in in both extremes, hot and cold, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lover of um, you know, we were talking before before we came on air about Wim Hof, you know, and I, I do sort of follow mm. Wim Hof and I do the, I don't have cold, I don't have hot showers or hot baths, it's all cold showers, um, things like that. And um, I find that very, very beneficial. And even sometimes going out on a cold day when it's a little bit, oh, you know, in a t-shirt and, you know, yeah. just go, going through that is, is quite, I quite, I find that quite invigorating. Um, oh yeah, I love Wim Hof, the Wim Hof method is, is great, you know, Joe Rogan's big on that and, he uh yeah it's, it's, a, it's it does work oh definitely um, i was watching a, a, he's, he's on the bbc at the moment isn't he i think and um that's right yeah I, f- I found out about him quite a long time ago through brian rose and uh okay he, he, you know that that method it's it's i mean it's been around for thousands of years it's yes he hasn't really made it up they use it in yeah. buddhism when they meditate yes. they use yes. it in uh you know, Qigong, you know, uh, Tai Chi, they use it, uh, in India as well. And yeah, I, I, I was, I've, um, I was with a, a monk that I used to go and see in Thailand and I sure. went to study for a year in a, in a temple yes. where in, in the province I was in, in Bangkok, and he would do a very similar type of breathing Yes, as Wim Hof, you know, yeah. um, so yeah, I think that's, that, that's good because it works in the cold. Or the, or the heat and I think Wim Hof's just trying to bring out a method that he found was beneficial to him where it's because yeah. he went through a lot of trauma didn't he his wife killed he, his he wife did killed. yeah his wife killed himself yeah it's, it's, it's an interesting well it's a sad story um, interesting story as well you know how he came to uh, be the person he is, is today didn't he and, try uh, to kill himself he didn't he jump into a a, a, a an ice pool or something and then it, it, yeah that's how he discovered the yeah effects of it. yeah the effects i mean it, it's it's a fantastic i mean i would say to anybody listening to this is you know try try some um you know some wim hof some some cold therapy and um you know you'd be surprised the difference that it makes uh, yeah. uh to you to your body and um yeah even, even things like um i mean a, a student has recently bought me a a whiskey barrel well got hold of a whiskey barrel for a plunge mm. pool for me ice, so yeah. i'm hoping to uh hoping to get that nice ice uh, ice bath would be lovely so um, yeah that'll be that'll be uh, very soon actually very soon so looking- yeah it, that, i mean that's if you think about it though that's where the the, the they do it in thailand where they put the ice all over them before they mm. fight yeah to sort of numb them and to yeah, yeah it's yeah. so it's it's an old method but i like the way that wim hof is yeah. packaged he's very good at his branding obviously he's packaged it in a certain way with the help of other people sure. um like you know when he was on london real i think that really um brought him to the limelight yeah i do you know i i haven't i haven't uh listened to that for a long time i, I was quite an avid listener of um london real i actually stopped listening to it when <sighs> brian rose was um trying to uh run for mayor that's right uh, yeah so uh-huh. I. <laughs> yeah, I stopped. I stopped listening to it at that point. I thought I'm not really interested in this. What <laughs> wanted some more, so uh, I haven't been back to it since. But maybe I'll 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 see see what's going on. Yeah, he's uh, he's just doing crypto now, Raymond. He's gone a bit loopy, but yeah. Oh, is he? All oh, right, yeah. okay. Maybe it's maybe right. maybe it's not for me then. Okay, we'll, we'll not see. anymore. <laughs> when, when when he was with Nick, it was a fantastic. I'm friends with Nick. It was it's a great podcast. It was yeah. uh, that was when it was at its pinnacle. Yeah. And then obviously you went to see Joe Rogan for a bit. And I think it's a shame what happened with Brian Rose because it was, it was, it was, it could have been the next Joe Rogan show. Oh, it was great. And then he went off on the sort of MIT money trip. And um, yeah, yeah I've, got, I've got a bit of a history with, with that channel. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. You know, Tim Ferriss, Ty Lopez, yeah. um, you know, Wim Hof. Uh, he had some really good guests. It's a yeah. shame that it's a shame it went that way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, really was. I, and I quite liked his um, 
his interview style actually um mm. pro- probably more more so at that time than people like joe rogan um yeah yeah whether it was because it was uh, a little bit more british i don't know um but it, it felt it felt a bit more comfortable for me yeah and then it, after he met Dan, Dan, uh, Dan Pena, it went a bit weird. But, yes, um, yes, that was, <laughs> that, was yeah, that was the, that, that was the transition. Yeah. Um, but he, I like the informality of it, the organicness, the creativity. Yes. That's like like with Joe with Joe Rogan, you know, a long form. Mm. You develop an idea. It takes that amount of time to really uh, peel away the layers of the onion sure. to get to the root of the problem. Sure. And that's where good podcasts teach you something that yeah. worthwhile um and it, yeah t- yeah t- damn pain yeah you <laughs> <laughs> i know i know i know i i, I did uh, i felt the same myself then. but listen m- m- moving on from there i mean you know obviously you know you you've done a lot of different martial arts you've got a, a an interest in martial arts journey mm. I, I always try you know what i'm teaching is to particularly not not so much the adults although there is that as well, but certainly with the kids is to try and uh, instill. Um, obviously, we have our, our tenets of Taekwondo, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, and the spirit, that type of thing. Um, I remember them now after you just said that. Yeah, try, try, try and instill, um, you know. I, those I, I, had the, I had those on my wall, Raymond. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. A photocopy out of the manual on, on the wall. On the wall, yeah, yeah, def- definitely. But, um, and, and trying to, try and, explain the benefits of, of doing a martial arts. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on what you think the benefits have been for you, um, you know, in your martial arts journey thus far. Yeah. I mean, I think that changes Yeah, a bit, I, a bit like we were saying before it evolves, you yes. know, it's quite, it's quite complex because when you're young, you don't really understand what it's doing. And I think it's only when you get older in retrospect, you really understand in a more complex and a holistic, it's like Bruce Lee. You don't really know what he's, doing and then it's when you in when you look back you go oh right he's doing wing chin oh he's doing savat oh he's doing pon and jackman or pon and tukin from the filipino Mm. oh he's you know he's doing more as a muay thai kick or that's you know and then it then it becomes interesting because you're you're deconstructing the framework of what this man is trying to teach you on a film and it's then it becomes more than just a film you know um because you, it gives you insight, you know, uh, yeah. and I think that's the same with any art form or any discipline, whether it's art, literature, filmmaking. Sure. It could be any discipline at all. The whole process for me, for martial arts, was really just training. Yes, uh, physically, just that visceral. Like when you see kids doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they're not they're not really thinking but they're they're rolling and they're they're learning right yes. like children do like the way in the same way that you learn a language it's 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 inherent and it's like a visceral response and then as you get into your older years you start to figure out oh actually i quite like fighting yeah <laughs> right there becomes a, a combative especially in men a combative yeah. element that comes into it and then as you get older, you 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 change again, yes. and you the development changes to more maybe cerebral uh, ways of thinking about about what you're doing and how it can apply to you know other things. Um, and then as you get older again, you think, well, you know, to, to, what's the point of all of it? You know, right? I, you know, sometimes I question like, why am I doing it? What, why and then you realize it's because it's keeping your 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 shell in good shape so that you can use everything else and um yes. i just think it's i just think that, that you know like certainly in academics you know you need to to learn how to think and i think martial arts teaches you to do that with your body you know it teaches you how 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 you think how you move how to relate to other people I mean, this it's endless, really, isn't it? I mean, I I, yeah. I don't think that's just martial arts. I think that's any any physical endeavor, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think as long as it's done with a with a, it comes from a place of truth. I think that's that's the key. 
yeah. The, the, the funny thing about martial arts is that they're all individuals, right? Yes. Like I've never been into collective sports like football or rugby or cricket or anything. It, martial arts are a bit different. It, they gravitate it because a lot of martial arts are usually some can be introverts, you know, or they're a bit more introspective the way their mind works. Maybe they don't have that group thinking. Um, I don't know what you think about that. It's interesting because it comes originally as an Asian system, yeah. which has come from predominant families and armies and stuff like that. And then it worked its way down into subsystems and then it became styles and, sure. you know, this process of growth. Um, but That's uh it, it's, it's yeah, well, well, no, I was just going to say, just to sort of uh, comment on what you said there about, you know, because I, I was heavily into football as, as a kid, um, from mm. a young kid over the age of sort of eight, eight or nine. And I, I, and I enjoyed it. Um, but it, it was never, it was never the winning, um, it was never the winning or the losing that bothered me, actually. Um, it was more the, again, the physical challenges. Um, you know, I, I loved the fact that I was short and I was a defender. And people used to look at me and think, well, I'll have no problem with him. And then all of a sudden they come up against a guy they couldn't get past or uh, could get above them and head a ball above them. And for me, that was great. But that that was worth everything. <laughs> you know, uh, winning and, and losing, I didn't actually mind that much as, as long as I uh, did my best. Now, sometimes in my class, and I talk about, to the kids, I talk about the difference between a, a martial artist and a sports person. And, you know, what are the main differences? And I, I actually do say to them that, you know, you can be a martial artist in a sports team. You just yeah. compete as a martial artist, you know. So in football, you play the game fairly as a martial, martial artist. You know, if, if the ball comes off of you and goes out, you know, you, uh, you don't appeal for it. You, you just say nothing and you walk back to your position. So I, I still think that they can, you know, a, a martial artist, you can play that team game. It may change the, the mentality and maybe some of your team players won't like it actually. Um, mm. But, um, you know, I, I think you can. I think you can get away with that. Yeah, I think you can. I think that comes from, like originally a lot of those systems were for armies, weren't they? They were taught in armies, you know, like in Korea and stuff. They were, you know. Yeah the military would use them, right? So they would have everyone lined up and yeah. um, it would be uh, that's, that, that system or that method would be to teach as many people as possible yes. to, you know, attack the enemy, right? It's yes. like the, the Thai armies, you know, you'd have the king and then you'd have everyone else below him. Yeah. And they would, you know, that's how. It, but when it, when it came into uh, a tournament, then obviously it's, it's two people. Um, yes. And I think really like uh, for Bruce, it was the, the whole method was about being an individual, you know, like mm -hmm. but that's more of an emotional thing that he he linked to his method and used his method to to teach people that, you know, like, you know, it's more metaphorical stuff, you know, being yourself and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's all, it's all, it's all good. I mean, it, it just depends. Like I, you know, like when I teach people, if I would have like a group thing to warm them up yeah. and then they would be in pairs, which is the way the ties do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's you're, you're you're constantly adjusting the the method to suit the individual as opposed to doing it the other way around where you're yeah. adjusting the individual to suit the style. So it's like, yeah, 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 no, I get that. Yeah. So it's, it's that. That was kind of what JK was JKD was about, and I think there's certain systems that do that really well. I think Muay Thai does that well. Yeah, yeah. So the Filipino martial arts do that really well. I think Jiu Jitsu does it well. Right. Um, there are a lot of systems that do do it well. It depends how you. It's totally depends on the instructor and what what his lineage is, how he thinks, you know. And yeah, um, individual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. No, I I I hear that, and I think also as well is that it's tough these days to be individual i think it's tough to be individual you know pe people because of the internet and yeah people you know want, want you to be part part of the crowd you see i've, I've always uh 
see myself as being fairly individual <laughs> in, in what I do and my thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, even, even some of the my regimes, perhaps we can, we can talk about that in this one or our next podcast that I adopt today, you know, people look at me as if I've lost my mind. <laughs> and, um, but it, it's, it's not a problem for me. I've always, I've, always, I've always felt that I've been a bit of an individual. Uh, maybe because of the way I've grown up and the uh, atmosphere and environments I've grown up in, mm. um, you know, the things that I've done mm. have always seemed to be, you know, not part of the crowd. And, yeah. um, I think know, a lot of martial artists feel like that. Yeah. Or people that train in those, a lot of boxers, like boxing as well is another one that, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people that are maybe not necessarily of the status quo mm. fit into that that group i certainly did and um boxing's a good one because it, it it has a lot of integrity i think this is why mma is so successful because it, if you notice with mma mma the, the the way it evolved you know originally it was strikers that didn't really know what they were doing and it was yeah. just this you i remember watching the ufc one with um with salvo you know yeah. salvatore who's yeah who i used to actually I talk muay thai to who's now running the the Gracie Baha and Bath and all that. Yeah. And um, I remember watching it with him and uh, it was just mental because it was on VHS. And you had this guy, that one guy with the one pad and then you had the <laughs> other sort of psychopathic karate guy with his <laughs> hands down by his side. And it was just like a bunch of barmen fighting <laughs> each other, wasn't it? It was just yeah. mental. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see the evolution of that. And then it kind of evolved. And obviously then the Gracies came in yeah, yeah. and it became, you know, these long winded, slightly monotonous yeah. grappling sessions of just geese being pulled around and sort of people were trying, what are they doing? You know? Yeah. And then people learned the jujitsu and the grappling and yeah. now it's evolved back to the striking. It's gone full circle. You've had this interesting retroactive full circle evolution which again is very similar to the system of what Bruce talked about. He predicted it, which is yeah. incredible, really, if you think about what everyone else was doing at the time. Um, talking about styles, and he just said, well, no, no, do it this way. You know, you encompass all of those ranges and you'll be a, you need a holistic system of fighting. You can fight anyone at any range. And that's what the, the UFC basically is. You've got yeah. two people that have learned all of those systems. Yeah. Muay Thai for striking, mostly in boxing. They've learned Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for the ground, best ground system in the world, undoubtedly, maybe with some judo thrown in or sambo or whatever. Yeah. And then maybe a little few things in between. You're seeing Filipino destructions come in, like yeah. with the, the notorious shin block against Andale Silva where he snapped his shin in half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the destructions do work. That's why I used to teach him. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it's mad. It's now become this system of striking where, a bit like Jeff Thompson said, the ground game has become a, a, a support system. Yeah, yeah. So the striking is your primary, the grappling is your secondary. And that, that was a true prediction as well. Yeah. And I just think that's really interesting the way that's evolved and the way certain people predicted that. Yeah. And um, that just, no matter what you think of those individuals, at least their, their method of thought was correct. Um, yeah, I, do, do you know what? I, I never watch it. I find it really boring. <laughs> uh, I do. Uh, forget it, forget everything I just said. No, no, I don't. I, I, I honestly, that. no. I, I'm I, joking, I, right. I, I consider I consider it really strange because people say, "Oh, you know, right. did you watch that?" But I think, no, not really. No, no. Okay. Um, if it's uh, an Eric Clapton concert, or I don't know. Uh, I love um, Eric Clapton. Uh, Noel, Noel Rogers on the guitar. Every time, yeah. MMA, I, I, no, I, I find it very difficult to watch for me. Do you like Do you like watching boxing or Muay Thai or K one? I, I like I like watching boxing, and I've done a little bit of uh, boxing myself, and I did some some boxing coaching and stuff like that. I do, I, I like that. Um, yeah, but uh, MMA, no, I find it. I, I actually liked it when it first started. Once once it got into the swing and it, and it started and it came in, I liked it because. You had, you know, uh, as you say, you know, a, a karate person. Um, versus, it was like a, it was like a computer game, wasn't it? Almost, yeah. It was versus, like versus street, like, it's like street fire. fire. Yeah, and you had, and they came on in their traditional sort of gear, and they took it off and whatever. I actually quite like that, and I like the fact that 
you know, bowing and whatever. I, I hate the trash talk stuff. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I've got to. Which, which puts me off. And, I, you know, the Colin McGregor, I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't think it's good. Sure. Um, I prefer him to, yeah, I prefer him to come in and bow, be quiet and just fight. Um, that, okay. that's, what, that's what I would like. Uh, the, everything else around it doesn't fit me. Yeah, I, I I think you're you're right about the 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 ethical dilemma that some of that throws up. You know, um, I'm not a fan of that either. But just from a more um, observational perspective, it's interesting to see the way that those things have developed. Yeah, yeah. And what certain people have said. Yeah, you know Bruce Lee being one of them, saying that actually systems will develop this way, and they have. Yeah. And I guess you could say the UFC is a sort of an experimental lab, sure, if you will, of collective systems coming together. And the way that it's evolved is is very interesting. It's fascinating the way that everyone now the human the, the human form has evolved into this system. Yeah. This pattern of like, right, you do the jujitsu for the ground game, right, you do the the striking for the standing game, and they've these arts that these people have predicted have came come to the surface, yeah. and it's like, right, we're doing the Muay Thai because it's because re- it bloody works, you know. Yeah. We're going to do the the boxing. We're going to go. To, I'm going to go and train at Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand to learn how to box properly and how to punch, and yeah. you know, I'm going to go to a, a, a Gracie Baja gym and learn how to to fight on the ground properly, you know. And um, I just think that's that's very interesting how that's yeah. how those predictions have come true. Um, yeah. And it would be interesting to see what Bruce Lee would have thought of yeah. seeing that, seeing his, if you like, his mission statement, his philosophy. Yeah, come through. Coming to fruition in the real world, you know, not just in a film. Yeah, sure. Well, listen... Um, I've, I've come to the, uh, we're nearly to the end of, of, of part one of this, and I'm, I'm going to do a part two with you. Um, I'm going to say to the to the people listening to this, uh, you know, I hope you've enjoyed that fantastic conversation with uh, Mr. Tony Stokes, uh, who's uh, very experienced in his martial arts, has done many things. Uh, I hope that you come back and join us again for, uh, for part two. Um, in the meantime... As we'll say, you know, look after yourself. Keep keep training hard. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, Tony. And we will uh, we'll come back uh, and we'll do a part two with you very soon. Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.